we will get started with this afternoon's webinar. Our speaker this afternoon is Kelly Alsop. Kelly is the horticulture educator for the Livingston, McLean, and Woodford County unit in Central Illinois, uh, Bloomington area, for those of you who are unfamiliar with those counties. Her topic this afternoon is beneficial insects, and uh, we have Kelly. Uh, well, Kelly, you've been here about a year and a half, two years or so for extension? A year. A year. So we're pleased <laughs> to have her today and uh, look forward to your presentation. Kelly, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Mike. Hi, I am Kelly Alsup, and I am a horticulture educator. I would consider my expertise as integrated pest management. Uh, to look at the first slide, I do have have a blog. I did this with um, the local food system and small farms educator from our unit, Chris Konechka. It was it's called Flowers, Fruits, and Frass, and I talk a lot about bugs, and then he talked a lot about um, vegetable and fruit production. Uh, soon, hopefully, uh, we'll have another um, another person writing that blog with me as soon as that um, that gets replaced that position. One of the, uh, my, how I came to be um, experienced with beneficial insects is I was a, a grower in a greenhouse at a research greenhouse, the University of Illinois Research Greenhouse. And we decided that we were going to incorporate beneficial insects into our integrated pest management program. And the reason we did this was because we were growing crops all year round. We had constant pest issues. We also had um, pesticide resistance um, uh, showing up. Uh, our chemicals weren't quite as efficient as they were before. And then we worked with a lot of students and researchers who preferred us to actually use the beneficial insects as opposed to the uh, pesticides. Again, I liked that because I didn't want to spray pesticides anymore. With the right knowledge, uh, beneficial insects can be very easy to grow, beneficial, very easy to use. Okay, so I'm going to go straight into the, uh, the uh, beneficial nematodes. And the beneficial nematodes, I think, could potentially be something that many growers use. It is, in essence, it comes in a little small packet. It's, it's like a little cake. And you put the cake in the water. And then you agitate it. And as you agitate it, this cake of nematodes starts to um, disperse throughout the water. Well, then. Um, what you do with the nematodes is you apply them on soil dwelling pests. Some of you um, look at the slide, thrips pupae. Um, these can be very beneficial on thrips pupae. That is a, uh, a life stage of thrips that most chemicals cannot control. Uh, fungus gnat larvae, any any person who um, grows inside and has wet conditions knows has a problem with fungus gnats. And then also, uh, the, these nematodes are being marketed for the, the grubs that you have in your lawn from garden chafer and Japanese beetles, the white grubs. Uh, another thing that they can be of benefit is lace bugs on sunflowers. So after you put this cake in the water and um, agitate it and get it dispersed, you apply these nematodes on an overcast day because UV rays will destroy them. I always consider a, a nematode application as kind of like a one-time spray application because the soil must remain wet. As soon as the soil dries up, the, these are no longer active. Now, you can apply these as a drench, or you can also apply them on the leaves, because some of this, the thrips pupae will actually pupate on the leaves. However, they mu the nematodes must, must contact 
the actual thrips pupae, and then they'll enter the, the, the body of the pest through a natural opening, and they'll release a symbiotic bacteria. So they may... Um, land on a leaf next to a thrips pupae or next to an, an adult thrips and the adult thrips will just move away from it. So that isn't always the, the best way to use nematodes, but definitely when they're in the moist soil, they're able to move towards their pest. Uh, this is was extremely uh, affordable and when used at the right time, right before you you know you're going to have an infestation uh, can be uh, can provide very very good control okay I'm going to proceed to the next slide uh, I love aphid parasitoids uh, aphids are um, they're, they, they're so prolific because of the asexual reproduction they can have one aphid can have a hundred offspring one Aphids are primarily female in the beginning of the season, and they give birth live. They give live birth, which is um, an unusual characteristic for uh, an insect. And not only do they give birth live, but they give birth live to already pregnant females, which in four days will start to produce her hundred offspring. So you can just imagine how the population builds. They feed on plant sap. They, they get that nitrogen and they, they want to get rid of that, uh, the, the sucrose. And so that's, that comes out as honeydew. And that's where you get the stickiness. So, um, so I just wanted to give you a basic rundown on aphids. But the aphids tend to be the easiest insects to control with beneficial insects because um, they're so prolific once a beneficial insect population gets in there uh, they can they really can go to town and they have a lot to work with so right here on the slide on the top the bottom right you see the aphids with the cornicles the cornicles are the little the little protrusions that come off the back end of the aphid that's an identification characteristic that actually secretes the honeydew. But to the top left, this is an, a parasitic wasp. Now this parasitic wasp is laying its eggs in the live aphid body while the larvae is um, eating the inside of the body and then they form a, a cocoon and they start pupating. And the brown ones are the parasitized aphids. They'll take a little bit of time to uh, um, fully hatch, but you would never want to spray this aphid population right now if you actually saw these aphid mummies, because these are aphid parasitoids just waiting to hatch, and they're going to parasitize the other live aphids on this plant. Well, it, this aphid parasitoid, um, it is a complete metamorphosis. So why do you really care about complete metamorphosis or incomplete metamorphosis when it comes to insects? Well, it is because the aphid parasitoid adult does not eat the aphids. She just lays her eggs in the aphids and then her larvae eat the aphids. But she actually eats pollen, nectar, and honeydew. So if you don't actually provide those kinds of flowering plants, then she won't naturally come to the plant. Um, in the greenhouse, we kept um, we kept uh, flowering plants for her, and uh, so they could feed on pollen. Uh, in a garden setting, you could make sure that you always have flowering annuals to um, attract to your garden. You don't even have to release these in a garden setting, but if you do want to release them, they uh, I will show some. Um, some sources at the very end of the slideshow, they, uh, they come already parasitized aphids in a little, little jar of bran, and you just, um, you just uh, sprinkle them around. But once you've ordered it the first time, you can actually keep the population going through having a banker crop. And a banker crop is usually a cereal crop. Um, these companies actually sell barley, 
with a birch cherry oat aphid. And this birch cherry oat aphid will only eat cereal crops. So it's not going to go on to your other crops, but it's going to keep this aphid population, aphid parasitoid population going. And this is something that we used to, um, in the greenhouse, once I knew my aphid parasitoid population was getting high, I would run through the greenhouse and try to look for more aphids because I wanted to keep the population going. And I didn't have to do periodic releases with this insect the way I do some of the other beneficial insects. I, I just wanted to say if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and type them into the box and I will go ahead and answer. So I'm going to go to the next one. Um, lady beetles. Uh, commonly, um, you know, for a gardener, uh, you know, you go into the garden center and you see um, these lady beetles for sale and they can be really affordable. Uh, usually what they're going to do is even though they say if you have a good population, they're going to fly away. So really, I think the, this could be used in a closed system. And I did use it in the greenhouse because they couldn't truly really fly away. They're going to find the food there. And then it could also be used in a high tunnel system. The only issue with these um, in a high tunnel system is that they need to be kept between 60 and 80 degrees. And that was one of the things that we learned in the research greenhouse was not only did we have to think about the different life stages of these beneficial insects we were introducing, but we also had to think about what kinds of conditions that we were giving them. So not only were we growing the plants, we were kind of growing the beneficial insects too. Did I spend more time working with the beneficials than if I only sprayed pesticide? Yes. But I feel like it was um, a learning experience and I had to learn as I go. Um, it's, and, and, that, and that will be you too. Um, if you decide to use beneficial insects, you will start to uh, see things uh, and you'll start to want to go and research them and uh, find out how to keep them going. So I, I just wanted to show you the ladybug eggs. I'm sure most of you have seen these, the, the small yellow eggs laid on the bottom of a leaf. And then you see in this picture on the left, there's a parasitoid and ladybugs taking care of the same population of aphids. The one on the right, this is a ladybug larvae. Now this one will eat 400 aphids in its, in its the cycle of this life, and that's only seven to 10 days. Uh, I did not walk up to an asparagus plant last year that did not have these ladybug larvae on them. Uh, a, a great way you know, I said, you know, releasing, you have, must release in a closed system, but a great way to um, attract these bugs would be to plant plants that would, um, uh, that, that they need. And they really love yarrow and dill and parsley and herbs and chives. You will see, and then most flowering plants, like a ray flower, like a cosmos, they're, um, they really love. So uh, in the next slide, I just already turned to it. This is a pupae. They're actually pupating on the transite benches in our greenhouse. So it showed in the closed system that we were getting a full life cycle. And that was uh, very good because we were providing the right environment that they needed. And so in the right picture, there is a, a ladybug adult. Now both the ladybug adults and the larvae feed on aphids. This life cycle is about three to four weeks. I do have a, another really great picture of very, very young larvae. They don't even have the marks on them. They've just, just, just hatched. And this is on the bottom of a soybean leaf. So, and if we can, if we can have these insects thrive in a greenhouse, they can definitely be beneficial in your closed system. And then if you're a gardener, you turn over the leaf, you look at this, it would be kind of scary to see this. 
But now you know that this is an actual beneficial insect and not something that you should spray. If you saw this, you definitely would not want to spray because you would be killing off these beneficial insects. I'm going to go to the Cifrid fly. Now, I mostly, um, these also um, are available for release. Now, you'll get them as eggs or you'll get them as a larvae, just like to the right, the, the picture on the right. These um, are, again, attracted to net the adults. They have a complete life cycle. The adult and the larvae feed on different things. You see the adults feeding on flowers. So um, again, if you don't have the flowers for the adults, they're not necessarily going to lay their eggs. But they will be attracted to the honeydew of the aphids and lay their eggs. So then you'll see this hoover fly larvae. Now that hoover fly larvae will eat aphids like crazy. But when you go out to your garden, or when you go to, if you've actually released these in your closed system, most of the time they're going to be at the base of the plant and they're not going to come out till the dusk. So if you went ahead and sprayed this, you don't really know that you have this, this larvae. So one of the things that I like to do is I like to put out a yellow sticky card and trap the adults. Yes, I am getting rid of some of the beneficial insects, but knowing what I have really makes it uh, me make a more a better decision as to what kind of pesticides I'm going to spray. If I have this Hoover fly, I am not going to spray because guaranteed this little guy will take care of your aphid population. And uh, it's a, a very common garden insect that you'll find. And we have used this in the research greenhouse and have had very good luck taking care of the aphid population. I'm going to go to green lacewing. Now, these are available for purchase also. Uh, do you see the little aphid lion in the bottom left corner? He's actually got a little aphid in his mouth and he's sucking the insides out and he'll just shake his head and drop the body. He will actually eat probably three to 400 aphids in his 10 to 14 day life cycle. Um, most people, even though they call him an aphid lion, he looks like a little tiny caterpillar. I um, found these many times in the garden last year. Uh, if you don't spray pesticides, you will find beneficial insects. Uh, they fed on aphids, spider mites, thrips, mealybugs, and even small caterpillars. And then I found the adult on a leaf. It was actually a sunflower leaf, and that one's on the right. And that, you see, the adult feeds on something different than what the larvae feeds. So you, if you want to encourage these to come to your garden, or if you want to keep them going in, the, in your greenhouse or your closed system, you want to make sure you provide some pollen and nectar. The way we did this in the greenhouse was six inch pots of marigolds. We used to use six inch pots of alyssum. And if we did get an insect infestation in our pollen crops, we'd throw them away and we'd grow new ones. Is an aphid lion the same as a green lacewing? Absolutely. The aphid lion is the larvae of the green lacewing. So they're the same thing. They're just different life cycles. So it's the aphid lion that actually you will see eating the aphids. And I guarantee you, if you find an aphid population in your garden this year and you turn it over, you will probably find these guys. Um, you, you really have to turn over the leaves and look underneath the leaves. They're not going to be just crawling on the top. Thank you for that question. Again, I just wanted to say, I'm going back because I just wanted to say that these eggs are available on cards and you can also purchase the larvae. Uh, the one thing that um, you need to um, do is if you're going to use these in a closed system, you have to keep reintroducing them because they don't successfully reproduce within the greenhouse or in a closed system. Again, if you're just trying to attract these little guys, 
then you don't have to worry about that outside in the garden setting. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Thrips. Okay, this is not really the 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 um the most the biggest problem for gardeners because yeah, the beneficial insects do take care of them. I'd say um a a small farmer or uh, somebody growing in a high tunnel probably has some issues with thrips and definitely greenhouse this is the number one insect pest. It, again, it pierces the plant tissue. You get deformed flowers, fruits. It also transmits viruses. Some of the crops that it attacks are cucumbers, peppers, ornamentals, flowers, and then it actually overwinters on weeds. So if you have weeds in your area and you had a thrips issue, you're probably going to have it again unless you take care of the weeds. Uh, the life cycle, uh, it, there's an egg, um, two larval stages, and two pupa stages, and adult. Um, one of the things that makes these so difficult to control in the greenhouse is that they're thigmatic. Now, thigmatic means that it likes to have, it likes to put its body in a tight situation. So it's going to be in the uh, base of a leaf axis or in the, in the middle of the flowers. So you're not necessarily going to, um, you're not necessarily going to get good coverage when you're actually spraying a chemical on these. Also, they're notorious for having pesticide resistance. They actually plant their eggs in the plant tissue. And so that makes that life stage very hard to control too. And then the pre-pupil and the pupil stage, they actually drop to the ground and you can't take get that uh, life cycle with the pesticides either. So that's what makes these western flower thrips so difficult to control. If you're in the garden, if you take a white piece of paper and you shake your flower and little bugs come out and they start going everywhere, you have thrips. Um, most growers know the little white pop marks are thrips damage or potentially egg laying sites. And they will, will cause a problem with production if you have too high of a population. I have, what is their benefit? They have no benefit. They actually will eat spider mites, but you would never want to release a flower thrips for um, spider mites. The only reason I'm talking about these is because I'm setting myself up for the next, um, the next beneficial insect. Um, this one you can clearly see um, the female thrips has a, a visible ovipositor. And uh, this life cycle is temperature dependent. So I just wanted to show this, th that's the reason why I talked about thrips is because I wanted to say the aureus, uh, the minute pirate bug is a great insect for thrips. Thrips tends to be the Achilles heel for most growers. Uh, the aureus, minute pirate bug, these are when they're harvesting the soybeans late in the season and you get those little little bugs called noceums and they bite your skin. They are aureus. Now we actually release these in the greenhouse. You'll see at the top right, that's a nymph. You'll see the bottom right picture, that's actually the leader with the brown carrier and there's adults and nymphs in that, in that and we're releasing them by putting a few, um, a, a little bit of brand on leaves around the room and then you'll see the adult. And these will actually eat a lot of thrips and they'll eat soft, other soft bodied insects also. I'm going to go to the two spotted spider mite. Um, yeah, last year uh, if you grew edamame or eggplants or tomatoes you, or cucumbers, you might have had the two spotted spider mite. Um, this one actually has a seven day life cycle. You'll see it on the undersides of the leaves. The mouth parts actually pierce the plant cells, destroying the chloroplast. So you'll see these little white marks. The females will actually go into something called diapause. 
and that's initiated by day length, temperature, or food. So let's just wait until there's, um, there's enough food available or the temperature comes back up. So even though you've cleaned out the greenhouse or cleaned out the room or cleaned up your garden, they can still come back. Um, they like really hot and dry conditions. And uh, you, if you have a really high population, you'll see actually webbing on the tips of your plants. So one of the things that I used to grow in the greenhouse, the research greenhouse at the U of I, was soybeans. So we had to figure out a, uh, a predators for the, the, the spider mites. And we were the most successful with these predator mites, a Persimilis and Californicus mix. Uh, the Persimilis, if you look in the picture, is the orange teardropped one. Now that one actually provides very quick control of the spider mite. And you'll see the two spotted spider mite in the lower middle part of the picture. So these are released together and they're also released in a bran. And the Californicus is actually one that feeds a little bit slower, doesn't reproduce quite as fast as the Persimilis, and it will um, stick around without um, a food source. If you have a high population of spider mites and webbing, they don't love it. So I would definitely spray soap before I introduced. But when I introduced these, I would introduce them once a month throughout a three-month crop life cycle of soybeans. And I would get excellent control to the point to where I almost never had to spray. Um, that is definitely a, um, a, a big win-win for us uh, because, you know, you spray a soybean plant um, for three months every week. That's 12 times um, with a chemical application versus one, a release of these predator mites once, once a month. I think this predator mite could um, definitely be something that could translate really well to small growers and even gardeners who have spider mite issues. And if you know you have a spider mite, say on a privet plant or you know you're going to grow at a mommy, then go ahead and start the release before you even see the spider mites. And then you will get, you will get uh, better control throughout the season. Name some plant. I have a question. It says, name some plants that host. I don't understand the question, but um, that hosts the spider mites. If that's the, 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 you know, the cucumbers, the tomatoes, the eggplants, the, uh, the soybeans, the edamame, um, as far as the uh, predator mites, if you don't spray chemicals, these may naturally occur, but this is something you probably want to buy off of the internet. Yes, host predator mites. Now you're going to have to buy these off the internet. They will, um, they will, uh, some of them will come naturally, but if you want to use them as a control method, you need to inundate them with um, you bought what you bought off the internet. They're really not an expensive insect either. Here is a picture of it up close. In the bottom left corner, that's just a dead spider mite, um, a two-spotted spider mite. The two spots are actually fecal matter. I love saying that. But And then the um, top right one, this is the Persimilis up close. Now he's the one that just voraciously eats. He'll eat um, 20 young spider mites or five adults in one single day, in one day. Um, so he's um, great, great at quick knockdown. I'm going to show the next picture. This is another picture up close. And what you'll see is the little white circular eggs. Those are spider mite eggs. And then you see the orange egg. That's the persimulus egg. And then you look right here, that's, that's a thrips pupae. Um, not a thrips pupae, um, a thrips um, nymph. So an instar, probably the first instar because it has the dark red eyes. So um, that just shows you the eggs up close and that they're reproducing um, in the greenhouse. 
sometimes this persimulus, if you lose spider mites, they'll just start eating each other because they're cannibalistic. Mealybug destroyer. Uh, this is one you're going to have to release because it's in a tropical ladybug, um, very readily available at the, on the internet. Um, it, it, it's on the left, in the left picture, the, the larger white thing is actually the larvae of this tropical ladybug. This is what eats the mealybugs. What is so difficult about caring for mealybugs is that they have a long life cycle and they lay their eggs underneath their dead, the dead female bodies. And um, that protects it from any chemical sprays that you can have. So you could have 600 eggs underneath one dead female. And this can be um, very detrimental to plant health, sucking out the plant juices, leaf yellowing, plant wilt. Um, these need to be established when the population is low. They will not, um, they will not um, take care of this huge population on their own. You have to use these in combination with other things, with other methods or other beneficial insects. Um, and they must be kept at a temperature above 60 degrees. Obviously, you cannot use them in a greenhouse right now or in a uh, closed tunnel system right now. Next slide. Um, Whitefly uh, tomatoes, uh, they were bad on um, eggplants. Uh, they actually uh, um, lay their eggs and then they have a crawler. The next, the next stage is a crawler form. And that one is mobile and it crawls and it finds a place and then it becomes sessile and stays there and starts to pupate. It'll feed for a little bit and then it'll go dormant for a little bit. And then it turns into this really odd looking pupal stage where the adults will emerge and the adults will be the white fly. Um, this can take between several days to a few months depending on the temperature and the life in the, in the, in the greenhouse. Well, these can be uh, a very devastating pest. And here I have whitefly parasitoids. And that's an Incarcia formosa at the bottom right. And then there's also Eretmoceros. Now these take care of the different species of whitefly. Now these come together on a card, already parasitized whitefly pupa. And then you put the little cards on the different plant leaves. Uh, maybe one to two cards per leaf. You have to keep this going. You have to keep introducing because they don't reproduce in a closed system either. So the Incarsa formosa actually go for the greenhouse whitefly, and those turn black. So if you see on the uh, on the slot, on the page, there's black whitefly pupa. Those are going to be um, future Incars future adults. Now, this will take 21 days, so that's why it's important for you to keep reintroducing these into the plants. Um, the errant moceris, it, it, it takes care of the silver leaf white fly. Now, that one was formerly known as the tobacco white fly. That one is very highly resistant to pesticides. Now, when it lays its eggs underneath the scale, it will actually turn them yellow. And if you see, there's fewer than the black, but there's a couple of yellows on this slide. Now, the ones that are still white have not been parasitized. So if you turned over, when growers look at whitefly, they don't look at the adults. They turn over and look at, for the larvae and the pupa. And when you turn over and you see something like this, then you are definitely getting parasitized. And they, they, these can occur naturally also, but you can order these off the internet and that would be the web best way to do it if this is going to be your control for whitefly. Here's an up close picture. It's showing the the wasp kind of developing underneath the scale of the whitefly. Colorado potato beetle, as far as vegetable crops and um, small farms, this is probably uh, one of the most notorious for um, 
for people because it overwinters as an adult. It has 500 eggs per female adult, and there is some pesticide resistance occurring within the, the larvae and the adults. The adults actually look like a black, yellow striped beetle, tomato, eggplant, pepper. They spend two to three weeks in this larval stage. Well, people are having issues with this. You know, you can do the row covering. You can uh, you can you can mulch with plastic because they don't like to crawl on the mulch with the plastic. But then you can also buy wheel bugs. Now, I don't know how many of you have experience with wheel bugs, but these things can actually really hurt you and bite you. But, you know, look what they're doing. Look what this larvae on the right side is doing to that potato, uh, the potato beetle larvae. I have read several um, bits of research on uh, potato producers actually using this as part of their IPM and being actually quite successful with it. Um, as far as ordering them off their internet, um, I have not found a source to order them off the internet. I'm sure it's out there, but just like with the attracting of some of the parasitoid adults, this is something that's going to benefit from flowers and herbs also. And Obviously, um, if you spray pesticides, you won't have them, but if you don't spray pesticides, they will start to actually naturally come into your garden, and they will eat many things other than potato leaf beetles. White fly predator. Um, this is also a little um, ladybug beetle that um, eats a lot of white fly eggs and scale. They're actually really quite voracious. Um, this one comes also in, like the ladybugs, you'll actually have the adults come. This one will come also it, um, in a, you know, a little can of uh, bran, and then you'll see the ladybugs, and they'll start to appear. And you just let them release and fly around. Now, this can be used in combination with the Incarcia, and for, and Incarcia erythmosaurus, the Incarcia erythmosaurus combination. It can be, um, you know, also this one doesn't like below 60 degrees, so this is going to be one that you're going to pull at certain temperatures also. And they can eat um, several hundred white fly eggs and scale in a day, which is proven to be very beneficial. When you order, these are suppliers that I personally have ordered from in the past. Um, Becker Underwood, they're good for nematodes. Um, the IPM Labs um, is more, I would say, more for greenhouses and homeowners and uh, gardeners. And the BioBest, definitely for growers, gardeners, vegetables. They also do um, pollination, poll cell pollinators also. When you receive these greenhouse insects, you can call these people. They have actually entomologists working there and are ready to answer your questions. I have been on the phone with two or three entomologists and ordered only, you know, $40 worth of material. So it doesn't matter how much you're going to um, buy. If you're a grower, if you're a gardener, they will sit there and answer your questions and give you more information on using their product. They want you to be successful because if you are, then you'll come back and buy more of their materials. Can the Encarcia erythmosaurus combo handle temperatures below 60 degrees? I'm sure they can handle it, but they won't be happy. Um, we do keep them going. My personal experience with them is on poinsettia crops. And definitely, I try to keep my temperatures above 60, but sometimes at night it doesn't go, it, it, it does go below 60. And I still have the Incarcia erythmosaurus. For them, every bug is temperature dependent. At a lower temperature, it's just not going to produce and eat quite as fast. But it'll still stay alive versus the other, uh, the, the uh, white fly predator that I talked about before. And then another thing that you need to think about is when you get your beneficial insects in, you can put them in the refrigerator and have them 
stay dormant for a little bit longer. But the sooner you release them, the better um, job they will do. You know, if you're if you get your beneficial insects at four o'clock in the afternoon and you were going to go home, you probably want to go ahead and stick around and release those beneficial insects before you go home. And then another um, piece of advice is some of these don't quite travel around the space quite as well. So when you get that brand, you have to you have to distribute it throughout the garden. Whether that's a tedious task for you or not, I actually loved doing that task because I um, I actually loved that task because it made me explore the area a little bit more. Um, another thing came from Hobby Farm, a question that says, are any beneficial insects not recommended when you have beehives in the area? Definitely. Any beneficial insect that acts as a generalist is going to eat your bees. I've seen a praying mantis eat a bee in a matter of minutes. I wouldn't have the soldier bugs. I wouldn't have the... Um, any uh, any predator bugs because those are more generalist. That's not something you're probably going to release anyway. That's something that's just going to appear. But do I think that you know your if you have a praying mantis population that it's going to totally wipe out your bees? No, I don't. But I mean I wouldn't release praying mantises if I were you or anything that is a generalist. So in the in what I've described, only through only. Two of them were generalist, and then you know the predator bugs are generalist also. Some of them are very specific, but some of them will eat other bugs. Okay, um, I just wanted to show some resources. You know, uh, there's not a lot of research on this, which is you know kind of confusing to me because I don't know how long IPM. I mean, I think we've always kind of used IPM or how long beneficial insects has been around. You know, I know that when I started releasing them in the greenhouse, it was not um, it was not a, a, a topic that everyone supported, and I had to show my results. And because I started using the beneficial insects, I reduced my, um, my pesticide spray by 70%, and that's how I kind of sold it to my boss. Of course, it was easy to sell it to the researchers because nobody wants to mess with plants that have pesticides all over them. Or nobody wants to lose their research because I have phytotoxicity from spraying their plants 12 times. But there's not a lot of research out there. I would actually love to do personal research on um, using these beneficial insects in the garden because that's what I've what expertise I've brought to you is what I've done within the greenhouse. Uh, I, there's a question that just popped up. Kelly, do you have resource good resource identifying beneficial so when a person were out in the garden and found an insect, they could ID it. Absolutely. Phil Nixon makes these ab great cards that you can um, really that you can carry around, and then there are so many apps for your phone too. I actually have iPhone apps that I download that give me um, stuff on um, identifying beneficial insects and garden pests. But to highlight two um, non-University of Illinois sources that are incredible. Do I have the title of Phil's stuff? Those are the good bugs and the bad bugs cards that you can buy um, through your extension office. And they're just they're just small, tiny cards, and they have a ring on them. And they're done by um, Mike Jeffords, also actually worked on this too. And you'll see a picture of the bug on the front, and you'll turn over the back, and it'll give you a lot of information about them. Um, they are excellent resource, excellent resource. What apps do you re recommend for the iPhone? Okay, right now I have... I have a, I, I just have a beneficial insect app and a garden pest app. Um, I don't know what it's called. I'm going to have to probably uh, maybe post that on my blog or something to uh, maybe some iPhone apps that I could share with you guys because uh, I can't seem to find that information right offhand. Um, 
but um, this North Carolina State University and University of California, these are excellent websites. Um, I did want to, um, you know, thank the local food system and small farms. And then Heather Lash, um, she actually is a research specialist, the same as what I was when I worked at the greenhouse. And she's continued this trend of using beneficial insects in the, in the greenhouse along with my predecessor. So they are still, to this day, doing a very good job of using these beneficial insects. And um, they're always free to show you guys anything that you would like to go if you ever came there. And then Greenhouse Grower. This is a trade magazine for gr greenhouse people. And this is where I got a bunch of my inspiration and information. Um, as far as how to you do it in the greenhouse, you know, I actually had real growers tell me what they did and what successes they have. Then I learned from their mistakes, and then I could actually do it. Um, I have another question. I've had good success in my greenhouse with purchased lady beetles. I'd like to keep using them, but I read recently that it isn't a good idea to introduce lady beetles that aren't indigenous to an area because they can potentially spread diseases to native insects. Do you have any comments about this, or do you know whether this is an issue with other insects besides lady beetles? Um, I personally have not heard of lady beetles spreading diseases, but I do know that um, if you were to ask the companies where they harvest their beetles, they will tell you. Um, I know uh, right now if you were to order them, they'd come from the mountains. Uh, um, so I don't really know how else to answer that question. Um, but it is something definitely to look into. Uh, I'd love to know. I'd hate to be um, spreading a disease. I mean, if it's inside a greenhouse too, I don't know if I'd necessarily worry about it because you're kind of a closed system, and even if they do get out of the greenhouse a little bit, um, it's not going to be as damaging. But it's definitely something to look into. Thank you for bringing that up. This is my blog. This is my praying mantis. He just posed for me. Are the insect identification cards available at all the extension offices? They should be. Yes, if, if they're not, Kelly, they can order them. Just tell them they need to order, and I'm looking at them right now. One is entitled The Good Guys, Natural Enemies of Insects. The other one's entitled simply The Bad Guys. And they are from the Natural History Survey, but each extension office, if they don't have them on hand, should be able to order them for you by that, by that name. Thank you. Are you a little reluctant to introduce a tropical lady beetle? in view of the problems we have with AZ laser beetles? Absolutely not, because they'll never survive our winters. Asian lady beetles actually are used to um, hibernating in the cliffs, and that's why they come into our homes. So I am not reluctant at all to introduce that tropical lady beetle, because it will not survive our winters at all. Um, I just got to, um, uh, you know, if you do want to go to pubsplus.uiuc.edu, this is something where um, all of the uh, extension publications are um, out there. When do you apply beneficial nematodes to control beetles? Well, it really depends what beetles you're trying to control. Let's say they're white grubs. Then I would control them when I actually I would actually do the beneficial nematode during the middle of the summer when they're laying eggs and they're young grubs. If it were, um, if it were, um, let's say lace bugs, I would do it again early in their immature in their immature um, their immature stages. If it and what about Asian beetle? What 
Asian, what kind of Asian beetle? Asian longhorn beetle, is that what you're talking about in Boone? Oh, um, just so you know, these beneficial insects do not control the adults. They only control the grub stage. They're only going to control what's in the soil. When can you control things that are inside this in the soil is when you know you have a population and you know you have the larvae of the fungus net in the soil um, or um, because you're not going to get the fungus gnat adult, you're only going to get the larvae or the pupae of the thrips. You're not going to get the thrips pupae adult. So it's um, going to um, it's going to do whatever's in the soil. Um, I have another question. Can you recommend a good resources that link specific plants as good hosts for beneficial insects? Yeah, that North Carolina one is pretty good. Um, but you could always do a Google search of beneficial insect plants. Um, anything that has an umbel-shaped flower or a ray-shaped flower tends to be um, the most of uh, the most benefit for beneficial insects. Can do beneficial nematodes reproduce in the soil and replenish themselves only if the soil remains wet? If the soil dries out. They're gone. Um, will the nematode take care of Colorado beetle larvae or pupae? I don't know for sure. I have not read research about that, but I would have a feeling that we could say yes. And it should be an experiment that is done, but I doubt the experiment has been done out there unless maybe Becker Underwood ha would um, have some current research on that particular problem and you could always ask them. This, this is my blog called Flowers, Fruits, and Frass. Um, I think the name is a little too clever because when I say frass most people look at me all perplexed. It's actually um, insect poop. Um, it's just my way of incorporating insects, and um, I love this picture at the top because he's just the the, the praying mantis is just hanging out. Now we actually did release praying mantises in the greenhouse, but they weren't the best at really controlling controlling the insects. Really, praying mantises are just a really good indication that you have a, a healthy garden. Okay, so. You know, with Japanese beetles, and this is a this is always a, um, a, a an issue. You know, when we're you know, I, I could talk for an hour on Japanese beetles. When we're talking about controlling Japanese beetles, really, the, you know, you can control the adults with certain pesticides, but um, you control the uh, the grubs when you see the adults flying. But um, they are really great flyers. So you can control your adult, your um, grubs in the lawn all you want and still get damage from the adults. So one of the things that I um, usually recommend is to not even control the grubs unless you actually are getting damage on your turf. Or if you pull up the turf and you see um, more than 8 to 10 grubs per square foot of your turf, then that would be the time you would definitely want to spray them. I mean, excuse me, do some sort of drench. And you could do a drench with the nematodes. So unless everyone in the county were to um, actually control the larvae of this insect, you're probably not going to get control over the adults. And that is a sad part for Japanese beetles. But there are definitely, I know most people are, are concerned about Japanese beetles. Japanese beetles come out late enough to where most of the time they're not going to kill off of your plants because they've already photosynthesized enough. And um, they're definitely, you don't want to spray some of the Japanese beetle problem plants because they're also going to kill pollinators and beneficial insects. So. Um, I would do the, um, you know, the hand pick method on Japanese beetles. That's what I always say. Or I might even cut off all the flowers just to prevent them from coming there in the first two weeks. 
control them in the first two weeks. We're about ending up end of our session, so let's take another question or two. Then we'll have to sign off. Could you have one more question, Kelly? Okay. Um, she actually uh, released some beneficials in her greenhouse, and they they did a good good control on aphids. Um, making the conditions right for the beneficials. I mean, you always have to make sure that you're feeding all the life cycles of the beneficials. You have to look at where they live. You have to make sure you're not spraying chemicals that are harming them. You know, there are some biopesticides out there that you can spray in addition to um, using these beneficial insects, but you really need to do your research on the internet before you um, make a spray application. Also, you need to think about what you sprayed in the past. Don't spray your plants and then three days later release the insects, because if it's an, a, a, a harsh chemical, you will that will all die out. Um, temperature is, I meant temperature and sometimes day length was very important to um, keeping some of them going. And, you know, that may not be something you can control in a high tunnel greenhouse. So you just want to look at the bugs that are going to do well at what temperatures you can offer them. Um, does the soil dwelling benefit, will it work in coconut core? I mean, I had rock and debris and I, I, I had soil dwelling beneficials do very well. It didn't really matter what kind of um, um, media I had, but I, again, have not done any research on coconut core. I actually know that they were going to introduce coconut core to actually reduce some of the fungus gnat larvae issues in greenhouses, but I don't have any um, research-based information on that. But, you know, I used to put them in the bottom of my, my ground beds underneath my transite benches that had debris and rocks and water and flooded all the time, and they would do wonderfully. Some of my ground-dwelling mites would do wonderful there, and some of the nematodes, too. I would do nematodes in my, um, underneath my benches. Again, if anybody's got another question, we can probably answer that. But uh, uh, if we don't hear another question within probably half a minute, we'll go ahead and log off now. So any last questions for Kelly? Thank you very much for letting me talk about this. I love beneficial insects. If you have any questions, let me know. I'm here for you. And uh, I will try to get some more information on my blog to follow up this talk. Thank you. Thanks again. Thanks again, Kelly, for sharing all your knowledge and, and, and your interest as well. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mike.